Love Talk Radio. This is Willie Yo. Bye, why you be? I can't speak English. Y'all listen to UMR. A special radio, eh? <laughs> hey, everybody. It's Big Perm. You're listening to UMOR, Uncensored MMA Online Radio. With your host, Big Perm and the Butcher. Knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off, knocking, knocking heads off. Get them knocking heads off whenever we let well, good evening, everybody. This is Big Perm, your host, along with my co-host, Dave the Butcher Clifford. Dave, how are you tonight? I am doing pretty darn good. And to uh, to borrow to borrow a little from my co-host, Big Perm, I am coming to you live from the parking lot of the Silver Lake Sand Dunes State Park in Mears, Michigan. What are you doing up there, man? I'll tell you, I've been riding dune buggies all day. That's just one of the few dunes, the few lake shores anywhere that you can ride ORVs and uh, motorcycles and all kinds of stuff. They got like hundred foot high sand dunes. You can jump them. I mean, they're, they're just. It's, it's, I'm having a ball is what I'm doing, buddy. <laughs> Good lord, man! That sounds like a freaking blast, man. Anybody ever looking for a badass place to take a vacation that really isn't just off the charts money wise? Check out the Silver Lakes sand dunes. And where's that again? That is in Mears, Michigan, right about halfway. If I'm looking at my hand right now, it's about partway down on the pinky side, about halfway down. Nice. Well, listen, uh, I did a little travel on this weekend, too. Um, I didn't leave Illinois. I just went up north uh, for Blue Blood MMA's uh, event Saturday, July 14th, was Mississippi Mayhem. And, uh, man, I, I got the first opportunity to do some commentary at that cage side with uh, Jason, the keystroke guru, Mug, from Amateur Combat Sports. And uh, we sat there, and we had a great time watching the fights, commentating on these things. And I tell you, I, that was my first experience commentating, and I, I think I'm in love. I think I've got a, a new career that I want to try. It seems... Uh, well, it's a heck of a lot of fun, but there's not much room for people. I tell you what, there's not a lot of places broadcasting. That's what kind of surprises me. How'd you guys do with that? I mean, it's kind of tough to find local events like that broadcast, or even, you know, it's really rare to have one broadcast live. I'm sure you guys were recording commentary to be recorded later. But to to, to be able to see the finished product when you do, it should be pretty darn fun. Well, and our, our initial goals were to uh, stream the event live. Um, but unfortunately, sitting there along the, shore, you know, along the shores of the Mississippi River, uh, we did not have a solid Internet connection. So, Everything had to be recorded, and uh, they're working on the audio and the video right now, getting everything synced up. And I can't wait to see the finished product. Um, I'm super excited to hear that and critique myself. But the fights were great. Um, there were two. Yeah, let's talk about the fights. Tell me about tell me about some of those guys on that card. There's, there's some tough top amateurs of Illinois, I believe, fighting on this card, right? Uh, most definitely, man. Um, there were two belts on the line. Like I said, uh, the co-main event uh, was the uh, for the Blue Blood 155. Actually, it was yeah, the 155-pound uh, belt, uh, and it was won by a guy by the name of Eric Perry. Um, he uh, defeated Winston Bailey, and Eric, uh, and you know, he increased in uh, his amateur record to 18 and two. And then, uh, let's see, that was the co-main event. And then in the main event, uh, the 160-pound AMI champ, um, he improved. Uh, he beat Mike Duckett. He improved to 15 and three. Beat Mike by submission. Also earned him submission. Oh, Mike lost. Yeah, we had Mike on the show last Monday, and unfortunately, Mike lost by submission. Um, it was it kind of looked like a knee bar, but then uh, you know, the more I talked with Anthony about it, um, he said it was more like an ankle lock. And I actually Heel got up? a little bit of uh, well, you know, he he or explained it as crusher. an ankle, kind of a mix of both. Um, I got a little audio yeah. up here of a conversation I had with Anthony earlier today. He couldn't join us live tonight because he has to work. He's probably working right now. I'm going to roll this, and uh, here's Anthony talking about it. Saturday, July 14th at uh, Mississippi Mayhem, you know, put on by Blue Blood MMA. Uh, you uh, reigned victorious in the main event. 
Uh, you now currently Blue Blood MMA's 160-pound amateur champion. Um, tell me what it feels like to have the hard war around your belt, brother, and uh, be the champion. It feels good. It's just the second battle I went out and fought for Chris and won, and it feels great actually getting out there and fighting after my last spot in December, so just getting back up and going again. And it just feels good to be out there and get another winner underneath the belt for the record, you know? Absolutely, man. And I tell you, with all that hard work and effort that you guys, you know, that, that you personally and, and every fighter puts in when they go to the gym um, and, and in their training camps leading up to the fight, um, it's got to feel good, you know, to uh, to be rewarded and, uh, you know, be recognized for that hard work and that effort that you put in. It's got to be a great feeling. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's nothing better than just getting out there, you know. Always another one underneath the belt. And now this uh, this fight, you know, you won this fight by submission. Um, I, from my from my vantage point, you guys were like actually right in front of me. I was sitting cage side commentating. Um, it looked like a knee bar. That you, is that what it was that you slapped on that guy with that a knee bar? Um, it was a little combination of a knee bar, but I had more of an ankle hook in. Okay, exactly. You were kind of turned against the cage. I couldn't see what was happening with his ankle. I was just trying to figure out what the hell it was. <laughs> I mean, I. I had his angle locked up pretty good, and just kind of wrenched a little bit and wasn't quite getting the results as I wanted, so I just kind of angled out, put a little pressure on his knee to give a little more support to crank on it. And then I put a little more pressure on that, seeing him crunch up and just sunk it in. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you also, man. I had your, your corner men were sitting right next to me, just to my right, and they were telling you to give it up. Um, you guys were rolling around, you know, playing the footsie game for, you know, about a minute or so, and you managed to get the upper hand. Um, you, did you definitely see something that your corner didn't see, that, that you just decided to stick with it, or are you that kind of guy that, man, once you got a hold of something, you ain't letting go? Well, I know he, he had my ankle locked up, too, so I didn't want to give him advantage to be able to crank up my ankle at all, so I grabbed him up so he wasn't able to move around much, didn't much to my ankle there because that's a nice plan on the ground. And we're just waiting for him to kind of release. And that's to while I'm waiting, might as well see if I'm able to improve on something I already got, you know? So Absolutely, man. It was awesome because, like I said, your corner was, was telling you to give it up. And I could see in your face, man, you weren't giving that. You were not giving it up. And you were right, man. You know, within a few seconds, you know, that like he ended up tapping. And uh, now I'm talking to the new 160-pound Blue Blood amateur champion. Yeah, Anthony, what's next for you, man? Um, just go back. There's some stuff I wasn't quite happy with about the fight, you know. So I just want to go back and study what I was doing and just tweak it in and get in the gym, put it to work, you know. That's what the amateur level is all about, man, bringing your game up to the level. That way when you turn pro, you can uh, enter the world of professional mixed martial arts and just beat ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, Anthony, um, is there anything else you'd like, you know, anybody you'd like to give a shout-out to, any sponsors you'd like to thank or anything like that? Um, I'd like to thank the gym for letting me get in there when I need to get in there, even though it's kind of awkward hours. And I want to get out, sponsored out to Miguel's New Style Barber out in Rock Island for a nice haircut he gave me for the night. So it's my sponsor, Kia Automar and El Mariachis. I mean, it's just so great because I know they're always there to help support the gym, get me the stuff I need in the gym to train with. So just felt real great. And I just want to thank all of them for it. Awesome. Well, Anthony, listen, I want to say thanks for taking the time to, you know, to, to talk with me today. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, good luck, and uh, I definitely look forward to seeing you uh, defend that belt, brother. Yeah, I look forward to I already talked to Chris recently about what we're looking at doing for that, so we have everything just moves up more from here, so. Right on. Well, Anthony, um, again, good luck to you. I know it's nothing but bigger and better things as you move up the ladder. And uh, take care of yourself and try not to work too hard tonight once you get to work. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right. Hey, listen. Dave, that was Anthony Angel talking about his fight this past weekend. Um, very humble guy. Uh, when I talked to him after the fight uh, and introduced myself, met him for the first time. Um, very soft-spoken guy. Um, and, you know, and he just came across as a very humble uh, gentleman and, and that's the one thing a lot of people don't understand about MMA fighters is they're not all uh, these big, bad, mean guys that are going to come kick your door down and, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. The street fighters don't get very far.
bar generally. And if someone at the higher levels tells you they're a street fighter, it's for fun. So to hear somebody like that, you know, he does. It sounds to me like that man does his talking inside the steel. And to see a, a victory on the leg, any type of leg lock victory to me, I don't know why or what it is, but it just tickles my fancy. I like to see those finishes like that. I like to see the old James Lee heel hook. You know what I'm saying? I, I really do enjoy that. Absolutely. That's and a big problem. This fight, when that fight, those boys, they, they quickly went to the ground and just started rolling around uh, playing the leg lock game. And Duckett, you know, at first looked like he had the upper hand with the heel hook, and he had it sunk pretty deep. Um, but Angel managed to escape it, and, uh, you know, he, he got back to his feet while Duckett was still on his back, and he was cranking on that knee, and you know, his corner in my ear, they're screaming, let it go, let it go, let him stand up, and they yeah. wanted him to, to strike, and, and boy, he, I could see it in his eyes. I mean, he was not letting go, and, and within a few seconds, like I said, you know, it was over with, and I hope Anthony prevailed. Now, I'll tell you what, I actually saw a knee bar finish in Flint. Where I was at this weekend, we did an amateur show in, in the murder capital of the United States Sweet. And in Flint, Michigan. Did you have your Kevlar on? No, they were armed security, and so we were more than safe. And so uh, knee bar. In fact, it seemed to me like there were more security than fans because this fucking it, – it, nobody showed up to this one. But I'll tell you what, the fighters sure did, and we had quite – Quite excellent action inside the steel. Uh, very safe. I mean, the whole staff did a great job. Just wasn't anybody there, hardly. But I got to see a knee bar finish in that fight. It was pretty cool. <laughs> leg locks are nasty, and if you know, if you go up against a guy who's good at leg locks, man, I hope, I hope and pray that uh, for your knee and your tendon's sake that, that you trained escapes <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, they're certainly hard to get on or to get in position to get on. But I've also noticed they're sure difficult to evade. A lot of people don't try them too much. It seems like some guys, or even like if a guy looks like he's trying it, he don't know what the fuck he's doing, you know. He'll just grab someone's foot and try twisting it. Till it's like, dude, <laughs> not that I know the technique by any means, but I can tell when it's not being applied correctly. Absolutely. Now, you know, I, earlier today I also talked with uh, the co-main event, Victor, um, the Blue Blood 160-pound uh, champ, um, guy by the name of uh, – actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't the 160. It was the 180-pound The champ. lightweight – it sounded like the, the co-main event was the lightweight and the main event was the junior welterweight. Well, no, Chris, that, my notes that I've got here are a little screwed up. The, uh, the co-main event was at 180 pounds. Um, that was Eric okay. Perry. And the main event was at uh, 160 the notes that oh, I Oh, okay. So that was a, that would have been a, a middleweight catchweight contest and a yep. great upon weight and and then a lightweight contest. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, man. I just wondered. Yeah, I wondered if y'all did it differently in Illinois or something. No, the notes that I have in front of me as I started reading through them, they uh, they're they're a little askew, but uh, we got things figured out. And uh, I, I had a chance to talk to Eric Perry earlier today. Um, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't going to be able to join us live tonight either, so I got a little uh, a little bit of my conversation with Eric Perry queued up right this here. This point, um, let's see, Eric Perry, you are now the Blue Blood MMA Amateur 180-pound champion. Um, tell me what it feels like to have everybody calling you champ. Oh, it's it's pretty good, you know. All the hard work, you know, paid off. So it's a good feeling. I appreciate it. Well, you improved your amateur record to what, eighteen and two? Am I correct on that? Yes, sir. All right, cool. Um, and I know with you know, I was just talking with Anthony Angel a minute ago, and he's the hundred and sixty pound champ. Um, I know you guys, you know, you put in a lot of hard work and a lot of effort um, training, you know, in your camps leading up to the fights. Um, how big of a part, you know, do your uh, your managers and your trainers um, and your coaches? you know, play um, in your game plan and in what you had planned for the fight this weekend? Um, my trainers, um, they're, they're pretty much, you know, just uh, help you with the head games, you know, if you ever doubt yourself, you know, to, to make sure, you know, that you have confidence in, in yourself, you know, when you got you got so many people that believe in you so much, you know, whether or not you believe in yourself, you got to kind of put that aside and, and just go out there and, 
and do what you're you're trained to do and and usually the better man will come out the victor. So, you know, that's that's really what I I'm a trainer, is someone who's got total confidence in me, whether or not, you know, I'm fighting for a belt or not. Just someone that, that believes in me is you know, in the moments where I, you know, I might feel shaky about it, you know, they they'll always give me the pet talks and uh you know, just to get my, my head for a fight. Well, I tell you, on Saturday, as I watched you enter that cage, man, it definitely looked like you had your head together and in the right place. And obviously, you came out with the hardware around your belt. Um, I lived in the Quad Cities for about five years, and I've been working with Chris doing the fit stuff as long as he's been doing it. Um, and I know you're, you're, you've are you're been around the MMA scene in the Quad Cities for quite a while now. Um, what's next for you? Do you have any plans on turning pro anytime soon? Yeah, um, that's that's pretty much what I, I'm looking forward for is uh, scouting out uh, my first pro fight. I don't really know who else who else amateur wise around here would 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 either take a fight or you know um, or would even be worth seeing. Um, and plus, you know, I'm not getting any younger, and uh, it'd be nice to start seeing seeing some. Uh, seeing some dividends on some of this hard work that that's get, that gets put in every day. Absolutely. Well, listen, Eric. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. That's, I wasn't gonna say <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to let you I was just going to let you talk away, man. <laughs> well, listen, um and uh, you don't want me to start talking shoot. I don't know how long your show is. What's on brother. your mind, brother? Speak your mind, man. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, you know, I love the sport, and, um, you know, as I'm going to school, you know, just figuring out what I want to do with my life. So, you know, fighting's definitely been around, and it's just time to time to start getting paid. Absolutely. So, and I got so a any, question any I like to ask. Out there, any promoters out there, that uh, that know who I am, or even if you don't know who I am, you know, get a hold of me. Um, if, if the how can they do that, right, Eric? How can they get a, How can they get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me on Facebook. Obviously, everybody's on Facebook, and if you're not, you know, get out of the hole or the cave you're living in. Go get a <laughs> go get some internet. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I mean that's that's the big way. You can get my number off of there. Pretty sure. Um, but if the money's right, I'll fight tonight. So <laughs> anybody out there, I don't care who it is. If the money's right, I will be there with a smile on my face. <laughs> so that's that's really where I'm at in my MMA career. <laughs> awesome. Well, Eric, listen, I just want to thank you for taking the time today to speak with me for a few minutes. I um, just wanted to have you on, you know, give you a little exposure as well, get your name out there, and hopefully uh, – Hopefully some of these promoters that are listening to the show will uh, check out Eric Perry on Facebook. It's E-R-I-C-P-E-R-R-Y. Um, and like he said, man, if you're not on Facebook by now, climb out from under that rock you've been living. <laughs> well, listen, Eric, I want to say thanks again to you, man, for calling, you know, being a part of this. And I look forward to seeing you kick some serious ass the next go-around, brother. Oh man, I appreciate appreciate everything. You know, thanks for thanks for giving me this opportunity to be heard, and um, hopefully, I get to talk to you again in the future. Awesome, well, Eric. You take care of yourself, brother, and have a good evening. You too, sir. Bye. All right, man. Later on. Well, Dave, that was my chat with Eric Perry earlier this afternoon. Quite the character. Oh, that was nice. Oh, and Eric, he's definitely looking forward to turning pro, and you know, I mean, like he said. He'd fight tonight if the price was right. Yeah, well, he, they, you know, and here's here's one thing I would think that was kind of funny. Now I'm not picking on anybody, and I'm not talking shit. But didn't he? Wasn't he just talking about how much his coaches got him ready for that fight and believed in himself and everything? Right. And those coaches should probably be the people that any type of promoter or matchmaker should call first if you're looking to book Eric Perry. Absolutely. So, I was a little surprised that that's not how it went because normally whenever I ask that question of anyone, that's what they say. Well, get a hold of my coaches. I fight for blah blah Mercilago MMA or I fight for, 
you know, the Grindhouse or James Lee's Match Fight Team, you know, and get a hold of James Lee and then he'll hook it up on the pro level usually. So hopefully his uh, that that his coaches will continue on with him into the next level, and that will probably be the way it gets done. You know what? Without a doubt, you know, and I'm I'm pretty sure that was Good there. Just put, oh, absolutely, man. I mean, this guy, like I said, he's been around the MMA scene in the Quad Cities um, for years right now. I mean, he's been going at it for a while, and he's put in a lot of hard work and a lot of effort. And I look and expect, you know, big things from this guy. Um, he's still young. He's, what, 18 and 2 as an amateur now. Um, that's a pretty damn good amateur record, you know. <laughs> and I, I would I would hope that uh, you know that could uh, transfer into the big leagues and when he turns pro. And uh, yeah, I know a few amateurs with records like that, and they are on the cusp. They are getting ready, and they are 160. Yes, sir, absolutely. And hanging on the line right now, I got uh, Chris Maltzberger of Blue Blood MMA. He's the the promoter and the man that uh, threw this event this past weekend. Chris, how the hell are you tonight, man? I'm good, Perm. How about yourself, buddy? Hey, I'm doing well, man. I'm actually sitting at home tonight, you know, down in the basement where it's nice oh. and cool. I'm not sweating nuts in the parking lot. <laughs> I got some AC in your grill. I like that. Butcher, what's going on, buddy? I am hanging out and just having fun on vacation here, taking a little break to talk on the phone, man, on the radio. Perm, what about uh, I was talking to Dave earlier, and he, he mentioned where he was at at that sand dunes resort. Saying he was huh? cruising over some hundred foot sand dunes. How amazing yeah, would that be? That'd be a blast. But it's awesome. you know, and right on Lake blast. Michigan. So as soon as you get to the top, you can just see everything. It's pretty sweet. Wouldn't that be amazing? Man, I tell you, I really want to go there after listening to you earlier. Oh, and to touch, I was listening to you guys earlier to touch on uh, what Eric Perry had said about how to get a hold of him, Dave. Just to answer yeah. that question real quick. Um, a, their coach is a little old school, and he doesn't have a Facebook. And uh, and and B, they I do know that camp. They actually all train a mixed martial arts group it's called MMAG. And uh, yep. Gary Schroeder is a coach down there, and uh, they'll 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 talk to promoters, but they'll run everything past Gary before they take any fights. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. I was a little surprised, and not not that I was trying to make sure. I was just like, I, I wonder yeah, if he, uh, you know. Thank you yeah, for clearing absolutely. that up. Yeah. That's cool. Sound yeah. like a damn good kid, too. Yeah, and Perm, the, on those notes that I gave you, what I was letting you know was uh, Eric Perry is the Trials of a Gladiator, which is my normal uh, series, um, as you know. Right. Um, I'm up to, like, Trials of, Trials of a Gladiator 13, I believe. And uh, Eric Perry is the 155 <laughs> amateur champ. Anthony Angel is the 170 amateur champ for the Trials of a Gladiator. Now this so I'm glad you cleared that up, man, because the notes that I got from you today uh, compared with the event program that I was looking at and those notes that I had, they uh, yeah, they kind of conflicted even, with each other. I didn't even well, were these catchweight fights at your event? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, Dave. What it was was okay. Mississippi Mayhem, we do once – it's an annual show once a year. So they are now the 160 and the 180 Mississippi Mayhem champs, which was at a catchweight, correct? Yeah, and that's an award okay, belt, so the correct? program was correct. Okay. Yes, yes. And to, Good. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't fucking up. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, and just to spark some more interest, just to throw this uh, hand grenade in there, um, Anthony Angel and Eric Perry is actually a match that I've tried to set a couple times and uh, a match that I still really want to see, and I actually had, had mentioned it to Anthony today. Um, the only problem about that match is they're such – they're both such outstanding fat fighters um, that Anthony very much respects Eric as a fighter, as he should, and uh, just doesn't have the proper time to go training like he wants to for a fight like that. You know what I mean? So it kind of, it's kind yeah, of and that, cause look, look, as an amateur, you've got to take take that. Yep. Sorry. No, absolutely. Go ahead, Dave. Well, yeah, as an amateur, you've got to take that into consideration with these guys. A lot of people hold amateurs to, to hire, uh, you know, standards and regards than they should in, in the in the respect that when these guys are working, these guys got kids, these guys got probation officers, these guys got shit they got to deal with in regular life that all the rest of us that are paying to watch them fight are doing as well. And sometimes we forget that at amateur shows because, well, people like me and people like you and people like uh, Jeremy and anybody else are there trying to make these events look professional and doing our best job to 
to to put our interpretation on what is professional out in the public, you know. Right, for sure. And I see a lot of people forget to take that in consideration, and they'll boo. I like I always fix that shit, dude. When fucking yeah, yeah, I remember people that boo. Show that you stopped that real quick. That was cool how you saved that one. That was nice. And this show, oh sure, you know, I mean, sure. These guys, these guys put their ass on the line, you know, to get in the cage. Um, a lot of the people outside of the cage that are cheering will never ever step into a cage, and and uh, you know me included. You know what I mean? So nothing but my hat's off to them. And uh, you know what? Whether you know, and and to me. Obviously, I would like to see my guys as prepared as possible, you know, in the gym at least four or five times a week and, and et cetera. But, you know, even the guys that just get in there on a whim, you know what I mean, still have to yeah. for getting in there doing your thing, you know, Chris, especially at an amateur level, you know what I mean? Chris, yeah. as I was leaving the event Saturday night heading home, um, I stopped at a little Casey's gas station. Uh, I think it was there in Andalusia. And uh, yep. I ran into Tory Mills. Uh, Tory yep. Mills was the fighters. Uh, I think – Porn star? Think no. no, 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 no. He's, he's, oh, that's Tori Wells. Tori Wells. My bad. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> if you <laughs> bounced the corner <laughs> off of her ass, it would stick in your eye socket. I love it. I love it. No, yeah. Tori Wells. Yeah, he's a good kid. He is, man. And, you know, even though he lost, um, you know, I, I ran into him and I, I congratulated him and I thanked him, you know, for the for the effort that he put forth and, he was kind of down, you know, and bummed and disappointed that he lost. But I told him, look, dude, so you got the balls to just even get in the cage. I said, look at me, man. I'll never, ever do that. Yeah, that's, forget yeah. it. I don't yeah, have it in me. Too. And so, you know, even in a loss, man, you know, I mean, you know, the guys, they, they got to hold their head high and, and, and feel a bit of sense of pride that, that, that they're actually doing something that most people don't have the balls to do. No, absolutely. And not only that, just to touch on that, I mean, obviously – these guys are in this sport because they are competitive people. You know what I mean? Let's just throw that out there. They're competitive guys, and everyone, everyone obviously wants to win at everything they do, but it's just the fact of the matter, you know, that age old saying there's always a winner, there's always a loser, and that's all it is. You know, you win some, you lose some, you hit the gym, you go back to training, and, and you, uh, you know, try rolling with some guys that are maybe a little bit heavier, so once you get into someone that's their own weight, maybe you got a little bit of an advantage. But, that, I mean, that's all Tori can do. He comes from a good gym. Uh, he trains. He just recently started training at Marty's Martial Arts. Um, you know, I don't know how long he's been there, but not that long. And that's a great gym, you know. So I know he'll rebound from this. He's a tough kid. Got tough uh, a, a mental attitude about it. And uh, I know we'll be seeing Tori again. So And hats off to Corey for, for winning knockout of the night on that fight, too. Corey Meyer from MMAG, which we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Chris, what well, do you it sounds like you guys had a great, great weekend, man. I'm glad you guys uh, had a crowd because I did. Oh, it was, it was fun. fun. I had a blast. Weather, the weather held up. Yeah, there was. You know, there's nothing like the show down at Ducky's the Goon Man because it is just. You know, you could always go to these big lights, uh, light show and big fancy fancy shows, which are great, obviously. But uh, to have a show outside, right on the river, like no shit, like I'm talking a, a, a rock toss away. Uh, from the yeah, much Michigan. much like Chesaning, Michigan, where we do it at a showboat. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. There you go. So much fun. Yeah, and it's just amazing. As long as the weather. It's a yearly event. Shows. You know, it's an annual thing, and it's awesome. Yeah. Dude. I want to be at the next exactly. one. Book me for the yeah, next. Absolutely. You already know, Dave. And actually, I'm going to be and speaking of that. Next, uh, speaking of that, going. Chris, and building upon what what was obviously a successful weekend for Blue Blood MMA. When is your next show scheduled, and should I mark that on my calendar? Yeah. There we go. Yes. I was just about to say that I was going to be calling you later on this week. I'm in the the middle. I don't want to throw out the venue's names yet, but I am in okay. the middle of a negotiation with two uh, very big places in the area. Um, I want to see which one sticks, and uh, either one will be uh, just as monumental as the other. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I I might possibly be doing something in September. And uh, if you are available, Dave, you already know that you're on the on the on the calendar. So, but I know you're a busy guy, so I'm going to try to get it booked quick so I can get you booked. I do have one weekend in September covered, so if you're in the middle or late September, that'd be awesome. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's what I'm that's what I'm shooting for. So every day I'm hustling. Hey, what the hell was that? I got to cut you short. It's almost eight thirty, and I got a phone call to make. All right, buddy. Hey guys, it was good hey, talking you. to you. Put, put me on mute. I want to keep listening. All right, later, man. What the hell was that noise, dog? What was that? That was the air horn. That was the fucking Jim Maltzberger off the. <laughs> <laughs> I had to hit the mute. Yeah, that was the that was the Kill Maltzberger air horn. 
Hi, that was the front Chris Horn. And uh, <laughs> at this time, we're going to be grooming him. So That's right, man. I mean, I could have shot him with an AK-47 or something, but I figured I'd just give him the horn and blast him off the line. Well, well I wasn't ready for it. I think I peed. <laughs> well, Dave, you uh, quickly change your panties, and uh, I'll, uh, i got a phone call to make here, man. All right, let's rock. Oh, boy. Let's see who answered this phone call. Sounds like a plane crashing. Hello. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing well, man. This is Jeremy with Uncensored MMA. You're on live with myself and my co-host, Dave the Butcher Clifford. Hey, how you doing, Dave? Nice to meet you tonight. Doing good. You guys uh, having a good time? Absolutely. Uh, Man, we always have a good time when we do this show. <laughs> yeah, imagine. I'll tell you what, yeah, we've been talking amateur MMA and uh, talking about a show they had over the weekend, but it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, and you are distinctively the very first ever middleweight champion for the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And it's great to have you yeah, on. This is true, this is, or at least this is what I've heard yeah, a couple times. <laughs> well, Dave, now, um, when, you know, Excuse me, guys. I've I've watched, man. I've, I've watched your career over the years. Ever since I started watching MMA, um, you were one of the one of the guys back in the day that were just handling business, and that's how you got to be the first ever you know, UFC middleweight champ. But I wanted to ask you, you know, who was the one fighter back in the day that that you liked to watch? You know, who was the guy that that just thrilled you? Um. Oh God. Damn question. Um, well, I mean, there's there's people there's people out there. I mean, I mean, I watched Anderson coming up, and Anderson's always been fun to watch, right? Um, always, always. Japanese fighters. Yeah, some of the Japanese. There's some of the style fights that you like to watch. I used to like watching a lot of the some of the lighter weight Japanese fights because um, you see them do some crazy, basically do some crazy shit, and. Um, mm-hmm. They didn't. They cross. They did not. Some of them didn't always cross over into the UFC, but they were you know, really exciting fights, and you, you you got to see a little bit of a different style. Then you saw in the states, um, um, but I'm trying to think of anybody else that comes to mind. I mean, obviously I fought fought him, but I liked watching uh, early watching Newton his grappling, and you know, and you know Henderson, Couture, all those guys. Um, I'd have you have to give me a couple minutes to think about who would, uh-huh. who would be my favorite, <laughs> and obviously. Well, I'll tell you what, Dave. Uh, this is the butcher here, and I guess you know, as Chris, uh, um, Chris and Jeremy had alluded, they know a lot about you. I have, I'm fairly new. I've I've been a ring announcer for four years, and I've I've really been trying mm-hmm. to catch up with what uh, mm-hmm. something that just consumed my life once I did it, you know. And yeah. so I don't know shit about you, bro. Not at all, and I would like to know. Tell me a bit about your style. What got you into ultimate fighting? When did you start? Who helped you get started? And uh, I really don't. I know nothing. And this is awesome to be talking to you because this is, this is what I live for now. I've, I've been getting chances to interview guys like Guy Metzger and Ken Shamrock and Dan Severn on this show and other shows that I do. And it, it just – I'm like a kid that's learning from a teacher now. I, I, I have no idea what you're about to tell me, and I'm ready to listen. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I guess I, I started out right. I wrestled in high school, <clears throat> and then uh, wrestled a little bit in college. Spent some time bebopping around the country, um, and I guess I ended up in New Mexico. Um, and I was training there. Uh, I was thinking of getting into doing some Thai boxing, and I guess that's initially where I was first introduced to a little bit to jujitsu. Um, and and then I trained for a while. Um, doing Thai boxing. Eventually, I headed back to Minnesota, um, and I decided, well, you know, it's something I can throw my energy into, um, and I focused on it. And I guess for what for the first year, I lived at the gym, like literally, slept on the floor, slept on the floor, um, had uh, tuna and beans in the back room for, you know, how many months, and then uh, um, and then just pursued it, and whatever fights I could, whenever I could. 
and bebopped around the country whenever something came up. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, what kind of organizations did you get to fight for back then? Got 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 to fight in every best VFW in the country. No, <laughs> I, uh, I fought. <laughs> I'm in, um, in the <laughs> Um, no, I, I mean, I fought where I could. I mean, I had some, you know, early on, I fought in the, eventually fought in the extreme challenges, um, through the Midwest. Obviously they had some really good shows and they have a lot of great talent that's come from there and how many different champions. Uh-huh. And then, you know, small show there and then, and then occasionally, um, bigger productions in Japan or in other countries overseas when opportunities presented themselves, um, and Dave, three. that was uh, one fight in Japan. You fought uh, was it Dennis Hallman at, at uh, over at Shudo back in '99, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I talked to a few fighters, and you know, there's a there's a big difference between fighting in America and, and fighting over there in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it like for you, you know, when you first went to Japan and and had your first fight over there, you know, in that foreign country? Yeah, uh, fighting over Japan. I mean. It's, it, you know, you got jet lag, obviously, so that's an issue. You have a little bit of culture. You're um, enamored by the just being in a new place and all the sights and stuff. So you're taking that in along with preparing for getting punched in the face. So I mean, that, there's, there's an <laughs> that, right? So, um, but in you, you get to their somewhat. Some of their judging can sometimes be a little bit different. So. Um, I know they in some of the organizations they early on they were they were scoring for catches like if you were in a submission and had to work out then it was going to score more positively like you know closer to like a knockdown um, depending on how hard it was for you to get out of the submission so there was some scoring you know things that you sometimes wondered upon and obviously anytime you go to another country and you're fighting fighting uh, someone from that country, then, you know, the, sometimes the judging can uh, not be a little harder. <laughs> to, to right. Well, they have a big pro wrestling influence, too, so it's kind of hokey uh-huh. in, in the same time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think I think that that's going to matter, and I, I think in some of the times it matters what organization you're you're fighting for and, and, and who is involved and who they brought in to do the judging. So, um, uh-huh. you know, if they're bringing qualified people in, I mean, the, I know some of the pride. I think they brought in Hume and some other people to do their judging, and some other organizations were more set. And then some made direct crossovers. I know um, what was Rings. I think initially were doing more of the fixed fights, uh, and then they they switched over to doing more legitimate fights. Um, and I think I know I know watching some of their decisions were was a, a little bit more than suspect. So whether that's because the people weren't, <laughs> whether the whether the people weren't uh, didn't know what they were doing, didn't know what they were looking for, or if they wanted to pretend they didn't want to, didn't know what they were looking at, looking at. But regardless, yeah, I mean, you anytime you're going into a situation like that, you know, you uh, you you know you're under the gun a little bit. You're gonna have to do a little bit more. Well, Dave, after uh, after going over, I say after going over to Japan fighting in Shudo, um, you know, you you mentioned Extreme Challenge. You came back to the states and had some more fights over here. Um, ended up back in Japan later in '99 fighting in that rings tournament. Um, I noticed both you we were talking about Japanese judging. Both of those fights went to decision. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you, know, you won the decision over Hallman and Shudo, and then unfortunately lost to Tamora in uh, the rings. Uh, two round. It was just a two round fight. But uh, when two you round fight in the fight. ring. The ring. The ring's rules were no punching on the ground either, to the head, anyways. So oh, yeah, I mean, that's it's right. A little, it's a little bit different rules. I mean, it was, you know, I'd have to review the fights. I know. I know. I my biggest grievance was, uh, I think, was a tournament coming after the Kuwait tournament, refighting back in the ring in the rings tournament and. I was I rewatched the fight and I, I believe I did everything to win and they put it into an overtime. They went into overtime and kinda of already clipped me. I hit the thing is he clipped me, I hit my ass on the mat, immediately popped up, had already punched him, and the ref broke it and called the fight. Oh jeez. Oh, 
So for TV like, or what? <laughs> Yeah, no I'm like, shit. what do you do? You know, I'm like, I hit for maybe, you know, half a second, pop back up. I had already hit him, and the ref called, and I'm like, I'm obviously not hurt because I just punched the guy. But, you know, it is, you know, you know, that's that's the world we live in anyways. Sure. You know. Humans judging humans, you know, I, it just, and they mm-hmm. do what they're told sometimes. Now, as far as that, now, now we're up to, what, 2,000 now? Right around there. What year did you win the UFC title, and how did that come about? What got you in that? What put you in position for that, Dave? Um, what put me in position for that? It was um, what uh, I, I guess the biggest thing was. Well, I guess it was I put together a decent string of, of wins, in the, especially when it was completely the uh, just MMA rules. I mean, I had a few, I think I had a few losses in the rings organization, but that wasn't straight, you know, there was no punching. Dave, over. and yeah, you, you put together some victories over yeah. some, some tough guys. I mean, Laverne Clark, Chris Lytle, Jataro uh, Nakao, uh, CJ Fernandez. I mean, Dennis mm-hmm. Hallman. I mean, you, you beat some tough motherfuckers, man. And then yeah. Pele, um, Pele early on. And I think it was through that period of time up to that. I don't think when it came for a period of time, I had I had quite a, quite a strike when it came streak when it came to just when it came to MMA rule fights. Um, and then we went to Kuwait. Um, and I think that's probably. I mean, I remember watching for I don't know a year or a couple of years. I would watch people in the ratings, you know, and people in the ratings that I'd beaten. Um, and I was still either not in it or two or three above them. Then I beat someone else, and then I'd be above, you know, I'd get rated above the person. So I made the march down from like ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Steady you know, making that climb. climb. So you were just going climb. after those guys. You would find fights with these guys. We'll find fights, or stuff would come up. Um, and then they had the Quake tournament, and the Quake tournament was um, was Hughes and Newton, Pele, um, and Barklop. So they had, you know, they had like. What, four of the top five guys in the world at the weight class, um, mm-hmm. and then uh, I, you know, I, I came away with a, I came away with the belt, and then after that, I guess that's what that gave me the nod to uh, to go for the UFC uh, 185. I'd up to that point been predominantly fighting at 170, um, but just you know bumped up and took the opportunity. Um, that was back know, on. We had, uh, it's September 28th of 2001. You, you fought Gil Castillo at UFC 33. This is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Good fight. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, right right after 9-11. So it was uh, wow. interesting. So I know we were, uh, well, well, I think it was I think right around the time that hand happened, I was down and uh, sleeping on Jen Pulver's couch, getting ready for uh, some <laughs> training for it. Oh. Well, speaking of Jens Pulver, he just signed with uh, One FC. Um, he'll be fighting over in Asia. That's uh, I always loved watching Low Evil fight. I met him a few times. He's a great cat, man. <laughs> yeah, he has a high energy little ball fire. Oh. When you were uh, staying with Jens, was that uh, uh, was that in the Quad Cities at that time? That's correct. Yeah, I was down in the Quad Cities. Um, I think I, I think I stayed there for a couple weeks. Um, just trying. So were you training with Militich then? Um, you know, in a couple different times I have, yeah. Um, usually a couple weeks here or a month here. Um, oh, so I was down there a couple different times. So, were there any so you're a true hybrid training? then. You you really do incorporate a lot of into your game. This is a this is really really cool to be to be hearing this from you, Dave. I really do appreciate you sharing a lot of this with us because. You know, it means a lot to know your history and, and to, to, to hear about how that came about. Now, when were you making the cut to 170 then? So it was 185 pretty easy for you to get to at the time? Because that's a tough weight class. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, at the time, it was, it was at that time, it was really easy. I know I can't, I can't remember who it was, um, but I remember making the night before meal. I think I had, uh, I think I had steak or something, and I can't remember. Somebody from the UFC came up and walked by and we and they're like, Oh, you don't see that very often. <laughs> no. Fake dinner, <laughs> dinner the night before wins. So 
But I mean, it was you know it was still a little bit of a cut, but it definitely wasn't that hard. But you know, there's advantages and disadvantages of that you don't have the weight, but you uh you also know, are not you're not uh you're not sucking as hard as everybody else. So. Well, Dave, yeah. you know, looking back, you know, from when you started fighting, you know, looking at the UFC and, and just MMA as a whole around the world, you know, how it's evolved from when you first started fighting. Um, did you ever think it would grow as big as it has, as, as it's gotten? I don't know if you – well, I mean, I can't say that I necessarily made like a, like a, a book or a – like, you know, I, I didn't envision everything. Obviously, would you're not going to – you know, you you might think eventually it's going to be as big as a given sport, or it's going to be as big as boxing, or it's going to be as big as this. Um, I I believe that it was going to be a great success eventually, um, and I guess initially just m- my view of it was, and I I had made some comments to other people, and that I guess that mattered if the if if the government decided to legislate against it or not. But I was just watching the you know, local community responses, the fact that, that even though it wasn't uh, completely embraced, that, you know, you kept on seeing shows. And you'd go to a small town in wherever, and there'd be, you know, you know 500 people, you know, 1,000 people <coughs> show up to something. Um, and I just... I do it every weekend now, man. I really do. It's yeah. my passion in life so I, these days. I call fighters to the case, yeah. Yeah, so I thought, you know, just by viewing that, I'm like, there's... You know, there's something here that's it's hit, it's hitting in a vein with people. It's something they want to see. You know, and when I'd gone to other sporting events, other things of you know, you just would, I wasn't seeing the same response. And obviously, it was something that people were passionate about, and it was something that you know more people could get involved with. I, and you know, they were, and yeah. So I I thought it was gonna. I always thought it was gonna be a success. Did I? think that it was going to enter into popular culture the way it has. Um, I, I can't necessarily say I envisioned that, but, you know, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, I don't think we've hit the hit the cap of it either, you know. I think no, I, I agree with you there. Cause, and, and you've hit a real great point there by, by saying that it's, you know, take me, for example, all right, I'm 38 years old. Um, I'm in fairly decent shape. I could probably – get myself in shape enough to learn how to defend myself and then strike, I could do an MMA fight within a year, legitimately, on the amateur level, easily, and sell a lot of tickets and it'd be fun and whatever. But I couldn't go be a running back for the Detroit Lions. No. You know, I couldn't go play any other sport on an amateur level. I mean, maybe I could join a semi-pro football team, but you've got 10 people in the stands. I mean, really. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> go to I MMA fights, I see MMA yeah. Go, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's maybe that's part of it is people, if they wanted to do it, they can do it, um, and and that's just not available. I mean, I mean, you have backyard football games and you have football leagues, local amateur football leagues, stuff like that. It's just, you know, you're not seeing, you know, you're not getting. If you have an am, if you're you have a football league, you're at, you're not. A hundred of your friends are going to want to go watch your game. You know, if you have a fight, no. there's a good chance a hundred of your friends will go want to watch the game. You know, so you oh, decide sure. to play football, but it's but it's because it's fun. And you, you like to play football, but if you fight or you train, you like to train. Yeah, just it's it's hitting a different part of uh, um, of a uh, person's psyche, and that's something they'll they'll they're willing to and they want to go watch. Maybe because it's more extreme, or however, however you want to look at it. But well, know, I see a lot of troublemakers hands. redeeming themselves not only with their own actions and learning how to live better. Troubled individuals, let's just say, uh, create fans because people remember when this guy was getting in trouble, or this guy was never doing anything with his life, and now that he's just an amateur fighter, this guy's got a job and a girlfriend now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's something, yeah, I, I think it's, it, you know, for some people, uh, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it personally with different people. It's sometimes it's a second chance, you know, and there's there's an aspect of, I think there's an aspect of that for whatever whatever human psychology or however you want to look at it. There's um, when uh, or how many times I've, 
and it's not always a good thing either because sometimes you hear people, well, so and you know, so and so said, well, who's so and so? Well, um, so and so's um, what? So and so's uh, UFC title well, uh, or UFC champion? Well, so and so is a molecular biologist, so why does he have an opinion on this? You know, but people will take their opinions. Because I can. That's why. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, it's it's an aspect. I I think like you're a victor, you're a champion, so then you're you're. You, it, 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 it uh, lends lends credibility to your character, um, and I think you know if you spend time and train and and you work hard and, and you sacrifice things, and I think too also people see that and then they respect the fact that you're you're willing to to work for something and to strive for something. And it changes so, the person. It gives them respect for their opponents. I mean, it gives people respect for themselves. I mean, I've, I've seen it. I don't. Do, I wouldn't just say this because I announced. I mean, I really see this happen to people that I've written off. You know? Yeah, and I think it's well. Then they, they, it's uh, whatever personal. Um, um, they, they can't live in their fantasy world, right? Person can't live completely in their fantasy world if they're out there training with people and they're out there competing, because um, they're going to have a bad day, or they're going to have to work hard, or they're not going to run a three-minute mile. You know. They're going to be. They're going to hit their caps. They're going to realize, oh God, this sucks. This hurts. This is pain. Um, mm-hmm. So, I think that's it's it's um, they're they're coming to a better personal assessment of them, per, personal assessment of themselves and where they are in the world. And sometimes the people, sometimes the people haven't had the opportunity to do that. And then I think sometimes troubled people, um, sometimes troubled people have um, used. Are you know use psychologics to allow themselves to live in th- whatever their tainted world was for whatever period of time, whether it be a bad childhood or other things. But you know, eventually that imprints in them, you know, and they they're they're living a bad they're living a bad cycle. They they're redoing scripts that aren't true. Well, it's something in this situation. They it's something they gotta they gotta live out and. Then, you get hit, it hurts. If you get hit really hard, you get knocked out. If you don't train, you get tired. Um, you know, it's a basic rea- it's a basic reality check for people. And now, let's say for you, what do you what do you do these days? Do you, are you still involved in training and helping people train? Do you have a facility? Uh, what what are you involved in these days, Dave? <laughs> um, I I have I train train people off and on. Um, I let my facility go, let's say a couple of years ago. Um, I train, I do train some people at a local place and I come out and help out. And then I've just been training more myself lately, uh, probably in the last year. Um, and then I teach privates um, and, and I occasionally work with a couple of fighters here and there. Um, but uh, I've, you know, yeah, so I'm, I'm still involved with training people still do seminars, um, and I still have competed a couple times in the last years, and I had an offer on the table a while ago. Didn't go through, and then I'm talking with some people locally about maybe maybe trying to make something happen um, in Minnesota. Where at now? Where are you at these days again? Sorry, I didn't get that I'm earlier. A, yeah, in the, in the land, 10,000 lakes. I'm up in Minnesota. Um, oh, so, cool. Well, you you are looking at King of the Cage does pro events up there, huh? Yeah, yeah, King of the Cage does pro events. They've done a couple. Gavin Rydell, Gavin Rydell does pro events at the Target Center. Mm-hmm. No, he's done a couple. Yeah, he's done a couple there. Actually, I was I was on uh, the first event, but that was me, Brock, and Gavin were kind of partnered on that. So, um, oh, okay. And, that was whatever the company out of Ontario, because originally we were. I dig Minnesota. I do. I love it up there. I had a fun time over there. So yeah. So you've been involved in oh. MMA um, for a long time. I mean, whether you're fighting, uh, whether you're training, um, throwing events, whatever. Um, what What are the best and the worst parts of choosing to follow your dreams of, of being a fighter? Um, and, you know, what are you most proud of? Um, what am I most proud of? Um, I guess I'm, you know, you know, I'm proud of, you know, that I did it, that I was uh, blessed to be able to accomplish what I did. Um, I'm, uh, um, 
proud that I, you know, I'm proud that I stuck it out, I guess. Um, so worst part is probably dealing, I mean, worst part is sometimes dealing with the sideshow antics, you know, um, and, you yeah, know, drama with different people and with uh, um, promotions and just stuff like that. You know, not, not, a, <laughs> huge amount of, not, not, not a huge amount of, of that happened in my life, but, you know, it's happened here and there, so... <laughs> um, Sorry, man. I know. I know what man. you're saying. Birds fly everywhere. I just okay. know what you're saying. That is so. I mean that. Wow. Mm-hmm. Damn. So, and you know, I, I just, you know, there's an aspect of it. It's a little more. What is it? A little more. Uh, from my, from my standpoint, looking at stuff as it was. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's there's always an aspect. You, you live in an imperfect world and, and people function in a way, a certain way, right? But as the popularity has grown and in, in the fact that it is in, in pop, pop, popular culture at this point and people are legitimately becoming rockers now, you know, for the first time, which I think actually after I won the title, I think Dana and Tito were walking in the elevator and they said something, you know, like you're ready to be a rock star. And I just kind of looked at them, I think I ended up looking at them kind of oddly, but I don't think that statement necessarily. I think that statement wasn't necessarily true of that time. Maybe a little bit for Tito, but I think it's becoming that now. I mean, you're seeing it's that. Pretentious. With the it's surely it's, pretentious. That's 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 one so, thing you can say about it. Yeah. And well, I think with that, with that, you, with that, you, you with that you attract uh, you're 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 attracting you're, you're attracting more people. You know, you're you're attracting sure. good people, but you're attracting a lot of bad people too. So. Mm. They're out. They're out to. They're out to be seen. You know. They, well, there's they, enough options. Enough. Like I think maybe where you were going with this even was that there that now that it is as popular as it is and it is part of pop culture, it's the best thing going today, as somebody from mm-hmm. Minnesota, Ric Flair, would say. Uh, the fact is that there's so many options. If somebody becomes foul, they run the risk of everyone jumping ship and hopping into the guy across the street's boat, and that, that, yeah. there you go. It's yeah. over for you if you get foul, and that's what we're trying to do in Michigan. We're we're shuffling people out of here that are doing, you know, now if you don't have a doctor and, and if you don't have blood work, I mean, even though we don't have a commission or we're not regulated in any way, we, re- we police ourselves to make sure that people that run promotions are either up to safety standards and provide a good show or they get run off. Nobody works for them. Yeah. And, I, I you know, and, and that's in my hey, view. Guys, I'm sorry to cut in, but we got about – Two minutes left with you, Dave. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Dave, just yeah, wanted to ask, man. Um, you know, say, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to let you guys know we had just had about two minutes left. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what what you said is a growing it's growing pains and of the sport and it's something that's necessary. Um, with that, I think too, because you get so many new commissioners, so many other people entering the sport that aren't necessarily as versed in what's actually happening, it, you know, it's a period of time on, on the learning curve for a lot of these people. So, you know, it's an aspect of, from my from my perspective, I watch it and I'm, I watch stuff and I'm like, what the hell are these people thinking, you know? What are you doing? I mean, are you, what, you, then I also realize I've been in this for however long, and they've been watching it for two years, you know. So Well, they've been real estate exactly. guys or used car salesmen. Yeah, exactly. So you're watching this, and you're going, no, that's not the way it is, and that's just why it is the way it is, and this is why this is the way it happened. Sure. And you're well, like, you got like you 30 know. seconds, man, so you might want to plug something or something. I don't mean to cut you off either. But uh, yeah, I mean, Sorry. just, uh, I, you know, I guess, uh <laughs> I have to thank all my fans out there. Um, somebody's got interest in a seminar or anything, hit me up on Facebook uh, or any uh, fights with any money. Um, I'm still out there. Uh, just fought in Brazil. I fought in Texas a little while back, so still active and still uh, still willing to throw down. So um, and awesome. thanks, uh, thanks for the interview and thanks for all the fans. Go ahead, Jeremy. Hey, are you there? That's good. Yeah, I'm yeah. there. I was just letting you go ahead. Okay, I'm, 
I'm sorry, guys. My thought my phone died on me. Um, oh. Well, Dave, this is Big Perm. I just want to thank you for taking the time to call in. You know, and well, actually, to sit and talk with us as I called you tonight, um, and hope that we can uh, do this again sometime in the future, man. Yeah, sounds like a deal. Thanks, man. Yeah, we'll be getting some seminars and, and some gigs off this too, man. I'll try to holler at some people I know and send them your way, man. Minnesota's yeah. a good place. Yeah, it sounds like a deal. Anything, anything pops up, so get, get me sure. back in the, you know, if 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 they, you know, right now I've been training. Obviously, I took two couple different, couple different fights. I might spend a little more time and do it full time if uh, I get one or two more opportunities. So we'll see. Well, good luck to you. Thank you very much again. It was a pleasure learning about you. Now I know more about the history of the sport that I love so much and that I'm now a part of. Yeah, thank you. You guys take care. Hey, you as well, Dave. Thanks again, man. Have a great night. Yep. Bye. See you. Wow, that was cool, man. I I didn't know your phone. I didn't mean to be cutting you off. I just couldn't hear you, so I just fired him out there, man. And no worries, man. My my thought my phone had died on me for a second, so it was no problem at all. That's why I was just kind of like, Dave, are you there? <laughs> well, you got to inter- you got to interview the first half, so that worked out cool, man. I had a great time once again. Thanks again to Blue Blood MMA. I'm glad you guys had a hype show on the 14th. Everybody look for that DVD coming out. I'm sure it's going to be arriving any day. My man Muggs at Amateur Combat Sports is working on that. Of course, my hey, personal Dave, sponsor. You, uh, before we yeah. go, do you got a second to take a call? Sure. I, I, I mean, I didn't know we had time. Let's that. roll. Yeah, we got a few more minutes left. I just, uh, I got uh, somebody on the line, and uh, they're hanging on. Hang Keep on. Just going. Here. Hey, uh, you're on with Big Parmer the Butcher. Who's this? Hey, this is Josh Bushnell. I just recently fought out of Mississippi Mayhem, and I just wanted to ask a question of the from Jeremy White. Uh, yeah, go ahead, man. As you were coming up, when you were an amateur, you know, and starting off, when you were picking your fights, was there any certain styles you tended to try and avoid coming up in the beginning? Or I'm a wrestler and converting over to jujitsu and kick kickboxing and whatnot. So, uh, is well, there something I was wondering. Well, it's a great question, but I'm not a fighter myself, man. Um, no, you're not. I am. No, but I am simply... Oh, he was probably world. trying to ask Dave Manet that, you know what I mean? But what were you saying? Let me holler at you for a minute. What were you saying, bro? I was saying, uh, as you were coming up as an amateur, was there any type of styles of fights that fighters that you tended to stay away from, avoid in the beginnings, you know, and progressed into those? Or were you just kind of an all-out all out fighter? Or, you know what I mean? Well, from what he had said, he, he was forced into different types of rule sets just to take whatever fights were available when there weren't a lot of fights going on. Right. But as – and you're, you say you're a grappler? Well, I was a wrestler, but I'm, I'm converting over to more stand-up. I prefer stand-up, but – What kind of stand-up do you use, it. kicks? I mean, what, what's your weight class? Um, not a lot of – I got – we can't use – I'm 155 now, about to drop to 145, so – Feather weight, nice, huh? Yeah, so I just I just fought out there at Chris Chris's event at at Blue Blood, and I heard you guys talking about. It. I wanted to chime in. And what ask kind of fighter did you have? Who did you? Um, what kind of style today, did you go against? This last week, he was he was more of a wrestler, and this coming week, I got a wrestler coming up. So I was just seeing what kind of advice they may have on those styles and uh, how to keep it on. I think you should there. probably take as many fights against stand-up fighters as you can if you're predominantly a wrestler and new to stand-up, because then you'll get seasoned at it. If you're already comfortable on the ground, you should be able to handle any jiu-jitsu guys or wrestlers, because if you're a pretty good wrestler, you know, you can usually get out of jiu-jitsu and get back on your feet, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, no, I did do a good job of that this past week. I, I pulled out a win the same way two weeks ago, so, so yeah, it was a... Uh... But, yeah, I just also want to comment and say the, the event that Mr. Mayhem was an awesome event, awesome down there in the river. Chris does a good job, treats everybody real well, so I wanted to throw that out there and just kind of chime in before you guys got off the air. So We appreciate that a lot. All right, fellas, well, I Maybe. appreciate I enjoyed the show, and uh, I appreciate the, the advice. Yeah, good luck in your You're career, man. welcome, man. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. All right, thank you. Hey, take your easy, man, and good luck. You too. Thanks, man. Alrighty, Dave. I think that question he was calling in with was yeah, I know, I know. Our guest, Dave, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, we can let it go. Uh, 
We yeah, let unfortunately, go. I didn't get it in time, but oh well. What the hell? It's great. I gave him some good advice, him. dude. I talk, great talking to Bushy Bushnell, man. The kid put a hell of an effort forth this weekend. I enjoyed watching his fight. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, he, Chris brings good fighters and puts on good events. I really do, you know, I really do enjoy getting to come to Illinois and Iowa and stuff, and uh, I'm looking forward to September for sure. Hopefully that's when it is. It's always a fun time at the fights, man. Shit. Yeah, I'm ready to enjoy Illinois. Well, Dave, you got any, uh, any last words for this week? Well, this is what I'm doing. On Friday night, man, we're at the Alpena Brown Trout Festival, and that's the tip of the mitten. If you're looking at your hand, look at your right hand facing towards you. The very tip of your index finger is where I'm going to be in Alpena, Michigan, on Friday night. A big festival. At the they Brown have up there. Trout. Yeah, it's a it's a big festival they have up there. It's like it's the second largest festival in Michigan next to the National Cherry Festival. And we're a staple there. This is the third year that we're doing fights there. And, you know, it's a big deal. There's award belts. And, it's, you know, the summer fight series here in Michigan is, is the, the bigger fights, you know, are largely, you know, based on events that are going on that we can piggyback onto and that can enhance the weekend for everybody. And then the next day, like, I mean, it probably I have to get up at 4 or 5 in the morning after that fight and drive all the way to the bottom of my palm to Jackson and doing a fight down there for Mad Men MMA and Steve Gossett. So I got a back-to-back good weekend coming up for me. And I want to give shouts out to people that, that, that hook me up, you know, like Defiant Industries, you know, these aren't my sponsors or sponsors of the show or anything, but my homeboy Anthony does MMA fight gear in Michigan. You know, he's always giving me stuff, and, you know, he, he's you know he's just coming on up, so I ain't trying to ask him for money or nothing, but he's my homeboy. So hook up Defiant, D-F-Y-A-N-T Industries. They make your official butcher sweatshirts as well. And uh, Elevation Training Mask, Sean Shirk, speaking of Minnesota, you know. So, you know, it's a lot of good things coming on out of this show. I really do appreciate Uncensored MMA Online Radio. And uh, also I have a show on Wednesday night at 11 p.m. Eastern, which is uh, 10 p.m. Illinois time. And um, that's What's called on Cage. Well, that's called Uncaged MMA with Chris Dantema. And we have, uh, you know, it's like this show with just a half hour, and it's based out of Michigan, and we talk a lot about Michigan stuff and have Michigan-type guests on there, but some national, and we've had some good guests on that show as well. And Chris is a fun co-host, good guy, good friend of mine. Check that out on Wednesday nights. And, uh, you know, really, I'll see you all at the fights. I had a great time once again. Jeremy White, big perm. You, you. Have it up. I've been over here smoking up your weed and playing with your emotions. I don't have your mo- I don't have your money, man. But you know we were. Hey, you know what, bro? You know, I got to. I, I ate some. Uh, I got. I had me some uh, some Michigan chocolate chip cookies this weekend. Did you really? So you enjoyed and some I, of our medicine. Oh, some of the fine edibles from the great state of Michigan, and I must say, did they you were sleep phenomenal. well? <laughs> they were great, and I, I just, uh, man, I want more. <laughs> That's sweet. Well, you, you got. To, I don't know anything about any of the uh, other particulars, but I myself take care of business here. My, you know, with the uh, Amen, proper channel. <laughs> well, David, it's been That's a awesome. pleasure, man. It always is. Um, thanks again for joining this week, and I will talk at your ass next week. All right. See you Monday. All right. Later, bro. All righty, gang. That was Dave the Butcher Clifford, my co-host, each and every week here on Uncensored MMA Online Radio. I just want to thank all of our guests for joining this week. Uh, Eric Perry, Anthony Angel, congrats to both of you guys. Um, big shout-out and thank you to Dave Manet for joining the show tonight. I can't say enough about that guy. Thank you very much, Dave. I um, also want to thank Chris Maltzberger from Blue Blood MMA for scheduling such great guests each and every week. I got to give a shout out to Fred and Mike at Tri County Cab. Don't drink and drive in Central Illinois, gang. Call 309 497 1111. They will get you home. Uh, of course, shout out to AJ at Jam Screen Printing. Uh, if you uh, got any screen printing needs, call AJ at PeoriaJam.com. I guess you can call them there. Go look them up. Um, QCInsurance.com. Thanks to you guys. Shout out to Jason. Uh, guys, join us next week, Monday night, 8 p.m., every Monday night at 8 p.m. Central. Take care, and I love you.